This video is going to cover the chemistry of the human body. This is lecture video two. The learning objectives that we'll cover are going to cover uh, basically atoms and molecules. We'll study a little bit about uh, the fluid chemistry in the body, pH, and then we'll focus on the main organic or biological molecules in the body like carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. We'll finish on the properties of diffusion and osmosis. So the first learning objective is to describe the relationship uh, among matter, atoms, and molecules. And this is hopefully going to be a very easy version of chemistry for you. So matter is pretty much everything around us. It occupies space and has mass. Matter comes in solid, liquid, and gas. And so we'll talk about uh, the stuff that we're made of and the stuff that we uh, interact with and eat and what we're fa what's found in the body. So atoms are the smallest stable units of matter uh, and think of atoms as the teeniest tiniest things that we'll really talk about in this class. Atoms are made up of subatomic particles you probably heard of called protons, neutrons, and electrons. And so you've probably heard that protons and neutrons are found in the nucleus of these atoms and electrons sort of circle around uh, and are found orbiting outside the nucleus of atoms. All right, so atoms come in varieties, just like things like ice cream. So what determines uh, which type of atom you're looking at? Well, it really has to do with the number of protons and electrons. So if you look at a hydrogen atom, it only has one proton. If you look at a carbon atom, it has six protons. And then uh, also, they'll have different numbers of electrons. One electron in a hydrogen versus six electrons circulating around and circling around the nucleus of a carbon atom. And if we look at different kinds of atoms, you might have heard of an atomic number. The atomic number is uh, basically based on the number of protons that that atom has. So again, hydrogen has one proton and it has an atomic number of one. Oxygen has eight atoms, or excuse me, eight uh, protons, and it has an atomic number of eight. So really what we're talking about, different types of atoms, we're talking about different numbers of protons and neutrons and electrons, which give them different properties and a different size. If we look at the periodic table of elements or periodic table of atoms, you can see some of the atoms we've been talking about and all the different atoms and types of atoms and variety of atoms that we find in nature. So some things we find in our body like calcium and iron and carbon and oxygen and other things we don't want to find in the body like uh, atoms of lead. So the, probably the coolest thing about atoms is that they can be bound together uh, chemically. So they can create chemical bonds between different atoms and then create molecules. For example, the oxygen in our atmosphere is two oxygen atoms bound together to make oxygen gas. You've also probably heard of H2O. Again, that's one oxygen atom bound chemically to two hydrogen atoms, and that gives us water, H2O, or water molecules. So the cool thing about atoms is they can be bound together to create molecules, some of we've heard of, like water and table salt, oxygen. Glucose is a bunch of atoms chained together, chemically bonded together, six carbons, 12 hydrogens, and six oxygens. You can see the atomic arrangement of a glucose molecule uh, here, uh, and you can see that there are a bunch of carbons bonded to oxygens and hydrogens, and that gives you basically the chemical structure, atomic structure of glucose. And if you look at it, it's six carbons, 12 uh, hydrogens, and six oxygens. All right, what's so special about carbon? We're going to hear a lot about it. Well, it's got six electrons, but the four outer electrons can actually be shared with other atoms, and so we can create four chemical bonds for each carbon. So carbon atoms start becoming the backbone of a lot of molecules that we talk about uh, in the human body and basically in uh, all living things. So it's not a coincidence that you see a lot of carbon atoms in things like glucose and fats because it's going to be the backbone of a lot of different things. Also, you're a lot of water. So uh, some molecules, when we stick them in water, they will dissolve. So something like uh, table salt, sodium chloride, when you put that molecule 
into water, it's going to dissolve into the sodium atom and a chloride atom. And we'll also talk about them being charged as well. You could also put in other things like potassium chloride and that will dissolve too. So why do they become charged? Well, the sodium gives up an electron to the chloride, so the sodium's positively charged and the chloride's negatively charged. We call these charged particles ions or electrolytes. You've probably heard of electrolytes. I like to call them ions. So basically, Na plus is an atom of sodium. It's uh, the Latin name natrium is how we get the abbreviation Na plus for sodium. All right, so now you're thinking like a chemist, at least a little bit. Let's talk again about what are the atoms that we expect in the human body. Well, that should be easy. It's just what we talked about. Uh, H2O, for example, that's made of hydrogen atoms and oxygen atoms. Uh, we talked about carbon being this sort of magic backbone of things like carbs, fats, and proteins. We're going to find a lot of hydrogens, oxygens, even nitrogens in our body. And again, those are the atoms we're made of. Salts like sodium, chloride, and potassium, and a lot of other stuff. Uh, but the basic components, uh, we can find those in the periodic table of elements or atoms. Uh, a lot of stuff we're not made of, uh, but some of these uh, common atoms are found in the molecules of your body. All right, and our textbook gives us a nice breakdown by percentage, but you see at the top is oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, uh, calcium, uh, things like potassium, phosphorus, we haven't mentioned that. If you look at this, you might be wondering what these are. Well, again, these are chemically bonded atoms creating some molecules I bet you've heard of. And if you look, it's made of things like carbons and hydrogens and things you've seen before. Uh, and the first one up there is a glucose molecule. The next one is an amino acid. I'm not sure which one, maybe alanine. The last one is a fatty acid. Again, these are all share these certain atoms uh, in common. The next learning objective we'll cover is a little bit about fluid chemistry and the fluid that we found, uh, fluid that we find inside our body and bathing our little cells, but also the fluid inside our cells. So you are a lot of water, uh, and floating around in that watery stuff is going to be a bunch of dissolved stuff. So we consider water the solvent, and then all the dissolved stuff solutes. So uh, if we talk about solvent and solutes, hopefully that vocabulary doesn't throw you off. But again, what are you? You're mostly water with a bunch of dissolved solutes in it. An important thing to remember is that the water and fluid composition inside your cells is different than the water and the fluid composition outside your cells. So extracellular refers to outside the cells, intracellular refers to inside the cells. And again, this fluid is going to be slightly different probably based on how we evolved. So let's take a look at the fluid. The fluid outside our cells and the fluid inside our cells is both water-based, but the solutes that are dissolved in them and the ions and electrolytes are slightly different. We find a lot of potassium inside our cells, whereas we find a lot of sodium chloride outside our cells. So I like to remember that outside our cells is closer to seawater. But again, it's very different. Potassium inside our cells, sodium chloride outside our cells. And we'll see when we learn about the brain and the heart and our, um, our nervous system and our cardiovascular system why that's so important. All right, so another thing to consider is that if we zoom in on our cell, we actually have a barrier that separates the inside and outside of our cells so that we can keep the fluid composition different uh, inside versus outside. So again, if you've ever heard the word saline before, saline is basically sodium, chloride, and water, and that's really similar to the fluid we find outside our cells. All right, so the fluid environment is the water, the water molecules, and then all that stuff dissolved in it. Uh, and again, we're going to talk about what's different between the inside and outside of our cells. Don't forget, your little cells are alive, and they like to live in a homeostatic environment. If suddenly you start losing a lot of water from your body's fluid, you're going to lose the water, but maybe not as much of the salt and the chloride, and now you're going to have too concentrated body fluid outside your cells. So you're going to have an increased concentration, or as we call it, osmolarity. If you have too much 
uh, concentration outside your cells, the cells are going to lose water to the body's fluid. And that's going to make your little cell want to shrink, and that's no good for homeostasis. So one of the things to consider is that the fluid environment, the amount of water, and the amount of sodium, chloride, and potassium dissolved in it is really important for our cells to stay alive. Typically, the osmolarity, or fluid concentration, inside and outside our cells is about 300 milliosmoles, or you can just think of it as osmolarity or concentration units. So if you were to compare the osmolarity of different fluids uh, that you might find in, in nature or in medicine, you could see that things like plasma and saline are the exact same or very close to the osmolarity of your cells whereas bottled water and seawater are very different. So your little cells would like to live in, in plasma or saline, but not in seawater. All right, let's continue with fluid chemistry a little more for learning objective four. And we're gonna talk a little bit about pH, uh, or hydrogen ions that create uh, the pH of a fluid. So since we're a lot of fluid inside and outside our cells, we need to care about how many hydrogen ions are floating around. These little uh, hydrogen ions uh, are electrically charged positive because they lost their one tiny little electron, uh, probably to the other water molecules uh, inside the fluid. So they're electrically charged, so we call them an ion. The pH is defined as how many little free hydrogen ions are floating around in the fluid, like your extracellular fluid, or your plasma, or your pool, uh, or your soda that you're drinking. How many hydrogen ions determines the pH? The pH is a scientific scale, goes from 0 to 14, to tell us how acidic or how basic uh, a fluid is. How many hydrogen ions does it have, or how, uh, how little does it have? So here's how the pH scale works, and it doesn't always make sense, but the lower the pH number, the more the hydrogen ions you have floating around, and the more acidic you are. The less hydrogen ions you have floating around, we call that more basic, and the higher number you have. So it's not really intuitive. A higher pH value means less hydrogens. A lower pH value means more hydrogens. Your cells like to live right about 7.4, 7.5 to keep them happy. All right, so again, let's look at the pH. What do we mean? More hydrogens equals a lower pH, and that's more acidic. Less hydrogens, a higher pH value, and that's more basic. All right, so acidic, more hydrogens, lower pH value on the pH scale. Normal water, normal tap water, should have a pH about 7, and that's uh, neutral, and it's based on how many hydrogen ions are around. If you add more hydrogen ions to 7.0 pH water, if you add acid, there's more hydrogen ions, there's more hydrogen ions, you must have lowered the pH then below 7. Again, an acid is really just a chemical that likes to donate hydrogen ions. If you add hydrogen ions, the pH will go down. All right, what if you have too many hydrogen ions? Your body might not like that, right? That's not homeostasis if we're changing things. We don't want to change our pH. So luckily, our body has another uh, chemical called bicarbonate. It's HCO3 minus. Bicarbonate can bind chemically to hydrogen ions and basically make them disappear and become CO2 and water. So by getting rid of the free hydrogens, the bicarbonate basically acts as a buffer uh, and gets rid of hydrogen ions and prevents the pH from changing too much in our body. So um, we'll learn more about that when we learn about uh, the kidneys and the, the lungs when we talk about pH. Why does pH matter so much? Well, it turns out that we need to keep the pH and the hydrogen ions fairly constant. Hydrogen ions like to react with things like amino acids, and we're gonna learn that amino acids are part in the building blocks of our proteins. So we don't want these hydrogen ions jumping on and jumping off and interacting with our proteins. It can uh, interrupt the structure and the function of our proteins, which would be very bad for our cells, which are made uh, of proteins. So cells don't like when the pH changes too much because it messes with their proteins. In fact, if you had too large of changes in pH, you can actually change the shape and the structure of proteins that are very, very important for you to live. 
And in a worst case scenario, if the pH was too low, too acidic, your proteins could actually break apart. That's how your stomach di helps digest food. So uh, the next learning objectives are to look at some of the common molecules that we're going to need to learn about in order to understand physiology. So these molecules include carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and finally nucleic acids. So you are what you eat. Have you ever heard that before? Well, we eat a lot of stuff, and hopefully you've learned that a lot of what you eat are carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins. So you are what you eat. And if you eat a Pop-Tart, well, that's kind of the same stuff that you're made of. So let's look at a label for a Pop-Tart, and you can see, you can see things like fats are in Pop-Tarts, right? Lipids. Uh, cholesterol is a lipid, so fats and cholesterol are lipids. There are carbohydrates, carbs, in a Pop-Tart. Carbs include things like fibers and sugars. There are proteins made of amino acids in Pop-Tarts. There's probably a tiny bit of water and ions uh, inside of a Pop-Tart. And then lots of stuff that we aren't made of, like yellow five and all these other things. But the point is, a lot of the things that you find, the stuff you find, carbs, fats, lipids, proteins, you find in a Pop-Tart, you eat, put in your digestive system, break apart, and that's what you're made of as well. Your body is made of carbs, fats, and proteins. All right, so we're going to look at the function of each of these and focus on some important things to remember. A key to remember, though, is one of the key atoms for all of these things is going to be the carbon atom because it can make four chemical bonds with four other atoms, and it's really small. All right, let's start with carbs, carbohydrates. Uh, they're awesome, right? Things like bread, uh, pasta. What are they for? Well, they're for energy. You've heard of things like glucose and fructose and maybe maltose, maybe lactose from milk. Those are carbohydrates. They're sugars or starches uh, that we get in our diet and we also find in our body. Glucose is a great energy molecule that our cells can turn into cellular energy called ATP. Carbohydrates can even be structural too. But let's focus on energy. Glucose can be chained together to be stored inside your body, in your liver, and your muscles, and we call that chained together glucose glycogen. All right, so glycogen really is if you just take a bunch of glucose molecules and chemically bind them together. Your body can choose to break it down back into glucose, for example, when you exercise. Some carbohydrate vocabulary. Monosaccharides equals one sugar. You've heard of a monosaccharide. It's famous. It's called glucose. Another is fructose, and a less well-known is galactose. Monosaccharide. When you hear saccharide, think sugar. Disaccharide. That means two sugars. Two sugars chemically bonded together, so sucrose, maltose, lactose. Those are famous disaccharides, and they're made up of monosaccharides like glucose, fructose, and galactose. All right, so whenever you think of sugars now and starches, you just need to think carbohydrates. Polysaccharides are really just long chains of these sugars, like the one we just learned, glycogen, which is made up of a bunch of chained glucose molecules. All right, again, and the main focus is energy. But I wanted to point out one example where carbohydrates are structure, and that includes uh, these little tiny structures, carbohydrates stuck on your red blood cells, which help determine your blood type. They're immune markers. Uh, and if you've heard of your blood type A and B, those are little carbs stuck on your red blood cells. What about fats uh, and lipids? Lipids is kind of a big category that includes fats, cholesterol, and even some hormones. One of the most famous fats in our foods uh, in our body are called triglycerides. You've probably heard of those before. So what are lipids good for? Lipids are good for th everything from energy to cell structure. We have these tiny little phospholipids, which are kind of like triglycerides that help make our cell membrane or our cell barrier. We also have some famous lipid-derived hormones because they're made from cholesterol, like testosterone, estrogen, and cortisol. All right, so again, what are lipids really good for? The most simple thing to remember is energy, and not just energy like carbohydrates, but very dense energy that we store under our skin and around our organs. 
Um, the amount of fat you have really depends, right? You can be very lean or you can have more fat in your body. But again, it really has to do with dense energy uh, that we're storing in our body. Way more energy than we could store in carbs uh, in our body. That might only last uh, several hours or maybe half a day. But the amount of energy we can store in fat could last days or weeks. Probably the most famous lipid is the triglyceride. Again, I like to think of it as a fat. Uh, it's a glycerol anchor molecule with three of these long chains. These long chains are made up of carbons and hydrogens, and these long chains are called fatty acids. Again, you might have heard of these things. So again, a triglyceride is basically three linked chains uh, or three fatty acids linked by a glycerol. And if you look, look at all those carbons and hydrogens. All those chemical bonds are energy. That's why uh, lipids and fats have so much stored energy in all of those chemical bonds. You may have heard of some things called good fat and bad fat and uh, a lot of that has to do with whether it's saturated or unsaturated or maybe it's an omega fatty acid. It really determines excuse me it really depends on whether it's good fat or bad fat depends on the fatty acid structure. And I am not a nutritionist or anything like that, but uh, you may have learned in your nutrition class about saturated. Uh, the saturated fats have all the little hydrogens on there. Unsaturated have some of the hydrogens missing. So these fatty acids can vary, and that kind of determines whether it's a good fat or a bad fat, better in your diet or not. Let's not forget about our little cells. Our cell membrane, which is the barrier of the cell, is made of these tiny little phospholipids, which is basically like a phosphate uh, and a couple little fatty acids tagged on there. And these phospholipids arrange into our cell membrane and create the barrier that's the inside versus the outside of our cells. What about proteins? Proteins are pretty famous because they're the structure and functional molecules of our body. So when you think structure and function in your body, inside the cells, outside the cells, you really got to think about proteins. In fact, the DNA code has information so your cells know how to build their proteins. Famous proteins you've probably heard of, hemoglobin to carry oxygen, keratin to give your skin some strength and barrier, including your hair, actin myosin in your muscles that allow your muscles to contract. Uh, collagen is a famous uh, extracellular protein uh, found in basically all connective tissues in your body. So proteins are all about structure, all about function. You may have heard of enzymes before. What is an enzyme? An enzyme is basically uh, a protein that does a function. Maybe it uh, helps a chemical reaction or maybe it builds other proteins or maybe it breaks proteins down. So what are proteins made of? Again, if we start at the atom level, we've got carbons, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogens. Those are arranged into uh, about 20 or so different amino acids. The amino acids are shown here. If you look at each of them, they've got a slightly different structure, uh, but they're basically a a hydrogen, oxygen, excuse me, a carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen chain. Uh, and so again, what are proteins made of? They're made of arrangements of these amino acids. And you arrange different amino acids, you get a different protein. So if you want to think of amino acids like Legos, you got about 20 or 22 different Legos to build all your proteins with. And you just simply order them and use different Legos and different orders to build different proteins. All right, so whenever you think of proteins, just think amino acids. That's the building blocks. And remember, the only thing in our body, or the smallest thing in our body that's alive, are our cells. Things like proteins, carbs, are not alive. Okay, what, sometimes we might actually look at the sequence of a protein. For example, here is the sequence of insulin, a famous protein. These are all the amino acids you need to build up uh, the protein insulin. And you may hear a word called peptide. That's just a small chain of amino acids. A polypeptide is a longer chain of amino acids. But really what we're talking about are proteins. Sometimes we might even want to give the letter code uh, of the amino acids to talk about the sequence to make a protein. A one letter code. So if we're talking about proteins, that one letter code is referring to the amino acids. 
you know, maybe uh, the the G represents glycine or the V valine. Again, these are the amino acids that make up, in this case, the protein keratin, which is pretty famous for being in your skin, in your hair. If we change those amino acids, then we might make a different protein. Interestingly, if your little cell needs to build a protein, for example, your muscle cell maybe wants to build some myosin, it's going to need, believe it or not, a functional molecule to build that protein. And what are our functional molecules? Proteins. So it's kind of weird to me that proteins are able to build other proteins. Proteins are also able to break down other proteins and other molecules, right? Digestive enzymes are really just proteins that chew up uh, other proteins or other carbohydrates. All right, what about nucleic acids? We're going to have a whole lecture on these, but nucleic, a nucleic acids are information storage molecules. They store information in your body. DNA and RNA are examples of nucleic acids. The building blocks for DNA and RNA are called nucleotides, and they're also made of things like carbon and hydrogen and oxygen uh, and um, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Okay, when you arrange those, you can make four basic nucleotides when we're talking about DNA. Those are adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. And sometimes we talk about them, again, using a letter code, sort of like we did with the amino acids. Now we just have to worry about ATCG when we're talking about the letter code of DNA. What kind of information do you want to store in your DNA? What kind of information is in there? Well, it's basically for your cells to know how to build all the different proteins. So in that DNA code is information about how to assemble your different proteins in your body. And we'll talk about what a gene is, but a gene is some information in the DNA so your cell knows how to build a specific protein. All right, our final topic here is a little more chemistry and some physics. We're going to talk about diffusion and osmosis. So diffusion is this interesting um, physical property of small molecules moving around. Osmosis is similar in that it's these small water molecules moving around. Uh, and it's based on the laws of physics. So we'll try to keep it simple. But here's what we need to know. Small stuff, glucose, calcium, water molecules, sodium molecules, they vibrate and move around randomly. Uh, they basically have a wandering or random motion and they move around inside our cells and outside our cells uh, based on a few rules. One of the main rules is that diffusion occurs from an area of more stuff to an area of less stuff. So, for example, if you have an area in your body uh, around your cell with a bunch of sodium, those sodium molecules are going to diffuse so that the, they distribute themselves equally uh, until they equalize. All right, so diffusion occurs from an area of more to an area of less concentration until the two concentrations equalize. Diffusion only works for small stuff very small distances. Something's not going to diffuse from your toe to your head. It would take forever. The cool thing about diffusion is it's free of charge. It doesn't cost the cell any energy. It doesn't require any ATP energy. So uh, that's another cool thing about diffusion. So let's think about diffusion of oxygen molecules from, ex for example, from the air in your lungs into the fluid of your plasma. If you have more oxygen in the air in your lungs, those little oxygen molecules are going to wander around till most of them, not most of them, till some of them or enough of them diffuse into the fluid until they equalize and then there'll be no more net diffusion. Uh, the oxygen molecules will still move around back and forth, but there'll be no net movement uh, from high to low because they've equalized. Let's look at another example. Let's say we have some uh, sodium uh, molecules and they're concentrated outside your cell. They will actually move around by diffusion until they equalize. They may not be able to get into your cell if the cell has its cell membrane barrier doesn't allow the sodium in. So again, we saw this is due to a concentration gradient and it's free of charge. It happens just from the molecules themselves.
What if you want to let some of those sodium molecules get into your cell? Well, in that case, you might just need to add a little protein or door that allows sodium through the cell membrane. Now you've got a concentration gradient of sodium outside the cell, and so the sodium molecules diffuse randomly into the cell until they equalize, again, free of charge. Your cell might not want those sodium molecules in the cell, and it'll have to try to force them back out that's going to cost the cell money because it won't happen by diffusion. Diffusion only is high to low, never low to high. Let's look at some examples of this. And actually, let's look at uh, the diffusion or movement of water, which we call osmosis. So water moves around randomly too. Uh, sort of moves around based on how much water is in an area uh, inside or outside the cell. So here's a rule of osmosis water molecules tend to move to areas where there's less water molecules or more dissolved stuff. So if there's more dissolved stuff, then there's less water. So more concentrated high osmolarity means less water. Let's look at an example. Let's place one of your little cells in seawater, even though we know they don't like that. Seawater has less water because it has more solutes, right? It has more sodium and chloride, so it's more concentrated. It has a high osmolarity. So since there's less water outside your cells, the water from inside your cells is going to diffuse out by osmosis. And we'll get water movement out of our little cells. You can imagine your little cell's not going to like that because it's going to start to shrink as it loses water to the seawater outside of it. Again, it has to do with the concentration of solutes and the ratio of solutes to water. Let's look at another situation. Let's place your little cell in some bottled water. Now you have tons and tons of water molecules in the bottled water in less concentration and less solutes, low osmolarity. So in this case, there's more water molecules outside your cell. Those water molecules will then move by osmosis into the cell. They can move across that little cell barrier, that cell membrane, and your poor little cell will start to swell up. Again, that's not homeostasis, so our cell will try to avoid that. All right, that's our chemistry that we need for A and P. I will see you guys in class.